the broadcasters are no different than I think than any other lobby, and I don't think that uh, that they are malevolent or evil. I can't really find myself critical of them as a general matter, uh, and they do tend, in so far as they're able, like every other industry of any size or importance in this country, to have Washington representatives to. Uh, secure the kind of legislative treatment, the kind of treatment from the executive agency and the, and the uh, quasi-independent agency, the FCC, that they feel their industry is going to require. Uh, when I was uh, sworn in, I went up to the Senate to uh, talk to the committee, the Senate Commerce Committee members, and asked them what their problems were in communications, what they thought the major issues were before the FCC, and, and to a man, I was always told that cable television is one of the big problems before the FCC. And uh, I hadn't really heard much about cable television at that point, to tell you the truth, but the more this uh, became uh, repeated, the more interested I, I got in the subject. And, and finally, I said to one of the senators, what, uh, uh, you know, I hear a lot about cable television just as a problem, but nobody goes on and says anything about what ought to be done about it. And he said, well, he said, some of my friends are in favor of cable television, and some of my friends are opposed to cable television. And I'm for my friends. Well, the uh, CATV business began with uh, very small operators. I mean, a fellow who would uh, be in the television uh, repair business or set sails would put up a tall antenna on the nearest mountain in order to wire cables into homes that would not otherwise buy television sets from him. And uh, it was at this time that the cable television industry was uh, really very violently opposed by the broadcasting industry. Now, since then, broadcasters have tended to buy into cable systems. And as this has happened, the opposition of the, uh, of the sub-government, of the, of the trade association, the National Association of Broadcasters, has obviously softened. Because now, many of the members of the NAB are, in fact, some of the largest owners of cable television uh, systems. And as that has happened, the, the process uh, and position of the FCC has changed to the point that uh, some have cynically suggested that the role of the FCC has been one of holding up the growth of cable television until the broadcasters own it, at which point it will be allowed to go, to go forward without restraint. The, the uh, function of government uh, is really to preserve institutions and preserve the status quo. And uh, so the FCC is in a, uh, in a peculiar position. They've been... Uh, trying to perform the regulatory function of, uh, uh, of the Communications Act of, what is it, 1934, I think. It is. Uh, right there is the story. I may say that the Communications Act is forward-looking. It encourages the Commission to encourage a larger, more effective use of radio, it encourages us to find new ways to uh, serve the public interest, provide for the national defense. I think we have a very uh, enlightened, forward-looking mission. I believe that our principal function is well set out, but there, as a result of technological change, as a result of new service concepts, there are areas where we could welcome some congressional assistance. Community antenna industry has made tremendous contributions to technology. It is something that has been uh, developed without uh, uh, significant congressional attention. It has had congressional attention in a sense that we've had some proposals before Congress, but actually we have not had the assistance of uh, guidelines from the Congress on this. Uh, the FCC doesn't act, it reacts. Uh, the city doesn't uh, act, it reacts. And when it does act, it doesn't act, uh, I think, in a too thought out fashion. Uh, and as I said before, the problem is being aggravated by the fact that they're constantly being pushed and they have to more and more in the posture of reacting to technological developments and to transactions that occur financially in the industry and to the commitments being made under the existing no regulation or minor regulatory scheme as it exists today. Uh, there is no overall plan. In a word, I would say that the industry is in chaos, total chaos. In Colorado Springs, the issue was importing programs from out of town. New York has seven VHF stations, four UHF. 
So CATV operators enlist subscribers not by promising more stations, but rather by improving reception. Manhattan skyscrapers block some viewers' reception completely, blur others with snow or double vision. Laying cable in New York is a slow, expensive job, so it's important to add subscribers quickly. Manhattan Cable decided to do that by offering feature films without commercials and at no extra charge on a vacant channel. But New York City's Board of Estimate needed to approve that origination of programs, and at the board's hearing last December 5th, a politically potent crowd opposed the move. Movie owners and labor unions in that field took the lead. Their technique, confusing CATV with pay TV. The only way uh, any kind of program origination is going to make any sense is either by advertisers or unless there's a fee for the program. Sure, there's a big green giant here. So let us end this poppycock that this <laughs> is a free bonus. In pay TV, a device scrambles the TV picture. If you want to see a program, you pay for it, and the picture is unscrambled. CATV, on the other hand, simply makes a monthly charge for its service. Some CATV operators, of course, would like to put pay TV on one of their channels. Pay TV will inevitably come, because when it comes, it's going to be a 10 or 20 or 30 billion dollar industry when it develops into full flowering. Now, in the American economic system, if you have the possibility of the emergence of a 10 or 20 billion dollar industry, you can't stop that no matter how you try to sit on it. And no matter how much you're in the position of the buggy whip manufacturer, you can't stop the automobile from coming. And in effect, the movie theater operators are fighting, fighting a losing battle. It might take them 10 years to lose it. It might take them 15 years to lose it. And indeed, the automobile and the horse were on the road together for a long period of time. We have to sit down and work out the details of how we can get into this industry instead of fighting. So many people are so busily protecting such parochial interests instead of getting together for the common benefit of everybody and working out the pattern under which it can be done. As the battle grew, cable origination foes marshaled a lies. An old lady wept at the thought of losing free television. A Negro who described himself as poor said free TV kept potential delinquents off the streets. Behind all that were the truly threatened movie house owners who submitted piles of petitions against the origination plan which they consistently linked to pay TV. Manhattan Cable, in an argument that was not totally philanthropic, replied correctly that the plan was not pay TV. All we're proposing is richer and more diversified entertainment and information for the city. Nobody's going to lose anything. As all of you gentlemen know, this very carefully worded proposed amendment prohibits absolutely charging one cent to any New York City resident for program origination. Well, I think that this leads to a, to a fundamental problem. Um, it costs fifteen to twenty thousand dollars to to put in a, a reasonable, modest, simple program origination facility, a simple camera, tape recorder, and so on. And the FCC has uh, got to stop contemplating its navel and decide what they're going to do about it. Because uh, if you're going to have program origination, you have to have some way to pay for it. It either has to be paid for by advertising revenues, the commercials that you look at on, on commercial TV, or it has to be paid for by the people. Let's really discuss this origination bugaboo. It's a phony issue. It's a phony issue because look at the problem CBS has in keeping one channel operative. To compete with them in their area means to structure yourself economically as they do. And to structure yourself economically as they do means that you've got to invest tens and tens of millions of dollars in programming and sell it to advertisers and in effect build your own television station from a software standpoint. No CATV operator is prepared to do that. So this origination issue, as far as today is concerned, is a bugaboo. I would like to originate on my CATV system something that cannot be originated on the broadcast because of the structure of their economic system. Some kind of television that you can have on when you have guests in your home and you are sitting in your living room and talking and you don't want to hear machine gun fire or see nuns flying. You don't want to be distracted by hard, hard cell campaigns about hemorrhoids. 
and you want to have something that's pleasant in the background, that's not interrupted by ads, and which doesn't really attract your eye too much, to use the medium that way. I used to listen to my old man tell my sister, be sure to come back from the dance with the guy that brought you. You know? <laughs> Irving Kahn is president of Teleprompter Corporation, right, which right. controls 19 cable systems around the country. In New York, Hughes Aircraft owns 49% of the teleprompter operation. It's got to be attractive, or the teleprompter stockholders ain't going to be all that happy. And I'm not about to sell down the river, aside from about 10 million bucks of my own money, several of a few other guys' money who were with me when I needed them. Khan was afraid that Manhattan Cable's plan to show movies would raise a storm. Okay. He prefers, for the moment, to seek subscribers by improving signals and originating non-controversial programs. Obviously, we are now in the cable business primarily to provide better reception and for local origination, which is a part of, the lo of cable TV and its fundamental concept. Diane Thompson uses a compact tape recorder to interview the man on the street in one of Teleprompter's franchise neighborhoods. The tapes are played back on an extra Teleprompter channel. It's a very modest operation, but demonstrates the potential for community service that so intrigued the President's task force, as well as Mayor Lindsay's. This is Channel 6, Manhattan Cable Television in New York. First cable television sportscast in New York. We're inaugurating this originating feature program for a rapidly growing cable television New York audience. By the way, in the ensuing weeks, Channel 6 will offer live concerts from Carnegie Hall of the American Symphony Orchestra, conducted by Leopold Stokowski, and uncut, uninterrupted showings of some of the greatest film classics plus on-the-scene coverage of some of New York's most pressing urban problems in our local community news programs. Meanwhile, on with the game, and to call the shots, Columbia University's Jim Golden. And here come the Columbia Lions onto the court, being joined by Brown for the start of this Ivy League encounter. Columbia 13-1, leading the Ivy League with four victories and no defeats. Brown is 2-12 and 0-4 and in the Ivy League. That happened three weeks ago, after New York City approved Manhattan Cable's plan to originate public service programming, with city authorities judging what is public service. No one argues about college basketball, but the real game will be played when it comes to the movies. The theater owners will again try to defend themselves against cable television, movie by movie. But Hayward Dotson, number 11, drives up for the layup and scores. There's the score. But Mayor Lindsay's task force came up with a plan for cable that would make it unnecessary to decide case by case what is and what isn't public service. I'm Percy Sutton, and within a few minutes, you're going to be seeing a town hall, a town hall on the lower east side the of Manhattan. The mayor's task force, headed by Fred Friendly, urged that the city franchise 10 cable TV companies. Each would serve different parts of the metropolis, each would have 18 channels. All would carry existing stations. Each would reserve some channels for the city's use and new program origination. The mayor's task force said each CATV operator should assign two channels as common carriers, meaning that anybody could lease air time. Another would be for public service programming, still another for anything CATV wanted to put on, which might be sponsored programs or pay TV. That again brought anguished howls from the movie theater owners and broadcasters. Mayor Lindsay himself seems reluctant to buck them right now, but publication of the comprehensive plan seemed to spur the FCC to action. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. We welcome you to the Federal Communications Commission. <laughs> we are, have two documents to present to you. We welcome your examination of them. At a rare news conference, FCC Chairman Hyde announced proposed new rules for CATV, which he thought were good news. And I think if you will examine them carefully, that you will find that they are constructive and that they look toward resolution of uh, problems that have heretofore prevented the expansion of service, particularly in the case of CATV. 
The FCC's proposal did not exactly inspire joy in the cable TV industry. It requires a cable operator to get permission before he picks up a program in one town and brings it to another. Most CATV operators are convinced that that permission will never be given. But the FCC action did encourage the origination of programs, and that pleased CATV operators like Manhattan Cable in New York City. The inquiry also would try to decide if CATV should advertise, but it would be years before the FCC would answer the questions it posed. And meanwhile, CATV is barred from bringing distant programs into the nation's top 100 markets. The battle with the broadcasters is still unresolved. Another battle with the phone company is just warming up. The biggest problem that we will have in terms of logical growth and expansion is in dealing with the bell system primarily uh, and with some of the independent telephone companies as to what our relative status is. Their concern is that anyone else having another wire into a home that has a greater capacity than the piece of wire that they have. The contract with a telephone company the use of their poles restricts the type of services that you can provide. And obviously the contracts are meant to keep you out of the telephone company's bailiwick. When you're on the poles, you're captive with the telephone company. We are not on the poles. We are not their captive. When we built the Colorado Springs system, we built it underground and at the same time put all the cable and conduit. Because of all of the research that's been done by a bigger corporation on uh, future communication services of the home, the time to put in communications wires was during construction. Coaxial cable permits two-way communication. CATV has no desire to set up a new phone system, but suddenly a lucrative new kind of traffic is developing from homes and offices to computers. CATV wants that business, and so do the nation's telephone companies. At stake, expansion, jobs, profits. And we want to adapt the use of the computer directly into the home and allow the homeowner to ask any question he desires that's been programmed with computer and get an instantaneous answer. A marvelous uh, a step forward in the communications field. Uh, the phone company wouldn't think of letting us do this if we were on their poles. We're not. Telephone company scared to death of us. Uh, we have the capability of putting an audio and video picture into the home. Uh, the telephone company with a present plan can only provide an audio service, sound, into the home. What I'm doing now, I'm calling the computer, and I would hope that the computer will answer back right now. Here it is, it's come in on the screen, and what I have on the screen here now is this from the computer. Hello, this is an IBM 360-40 computer at Bell Labs. Please identify yourself by keying your digit extension number using your touchtone keys. Now, what they're asking me to do is identify myself by keying my number, which is 6991, into the computer. And it immediately answers back, thank you, Mr. Ellinghouse. William T. Ellinghaus, AT&T vice president, and one of the 100 people in the world with picture phone, says it will be years before picture joins sound on everybody's telephone. But he's enthusiastic about computer applications in the near future. The same job Bill Daniels wants for CATV cable. It says to review the list, please key number one, which I will key, and I will get a list of the services that this computer is going to offer me. And now I have a list here. If I dial 1-1, one, one, I can get the calculator, 1-2 AT&T stock, 1-3 the stock market, 1-4 weather forecast. So let's try 1-2 and see what AT&T stock is doing today. It enables the businessman right sitting at his desk to have instantaneous access to all kinds of information that he needs to, to run his job and, and to do it well. You can go on and on and visualize that with picture phone, your own telephone service really, you have access, not only on a voice basis, but visually with everything that you had to leave your premises and go someplace else to see before. You just don't stop with a picture phone. You gotta think about things that nobody's even thought of. I re you don't realize that's a silly statement, but uh, the fantastic improvements being made in electronics, who knows what we're going to use it for next. We know we're as well or better equipped to provide the services than the telephone company. We're ready. 
I think there is a general feeling that we are a large organization and we do have a medium into, into customers' homes. And I think generally there is a fear that uh, since they are getting into the same type of area, that, uh, that we pose for them a rather large competitive threat. I think there's generally misunderstanding, and I must say maybe lack of commu good communications between us. So our efforts really have been directed to promoting the CATV uh, medium rather than opposing it or, or holding uh, uh, anything ominous in store for them. I don't think the, the telephone company is, is anti-CATV. Uh, they just like to make money. And they started out uh, with a very unrealistic uh, schedule of rates. Then the telephone company began to realize uh, well, maybe they were missing out on, on some pretty good business. Well, now, I think it's fair to say, though, Wes, that they really were uh, pretty uh, uh, aggressive. aggressively opposed, as were the broadcasters originally, to uh, CATV. Uh, for, you know, for good and sufficient reason that they thought that this was their uh, function to provide service to the home and, and uh, in their own good time that I think that they had probably expected that they would do so. There's no question but that to some extent my CATV operation is in the hands of the telephone company. They control the cable facilities. Mort David isn't fighting AT&T. His CATV operation uses telephone company cable that lies in ducts under the streets of New York. I think the telephone company would be more scrupulous than any other company in seeing that the independent operator, my company, can, can make do and can make money in the business. Hello. Yeah. Tell them to pay against delivery at about $61 a share. Yeah. Tell them to pay. I'll send them instruction in writing later. Goodbye. In other words, perhaps it is more sensible, as I believe, to render unto Caesar what is Caesar's, and not to lay cable in the streets of the city of New York, to let the telephone company do that. That's the business that they're in, is constructing communications facilities in the public ways and in public streets. Everybody's got their gripes against the telephone company. Uh, the CATV operators, the city, the government, the people, uh, when you don't get your dime back in the phone booth and uh, they make you dial, 15-digit numbers to get across uh, the river. Everybody's got their gripe against the phone company, but we all must admit that still the phone company is a viable operative entity and that when a telephone rings, you press the button, it may cost you 15 cents a month for the light, but if you lift the receiver, you get a telephone call. Hello? Quickly. Next. Mort David worries little over AT&T's right. size as a monopoly, the FCC is supposed to regulate it, but AT&T is already so big, its legal staff so canny in finding loopholes, some experts argue it can't really be regulated. Thus, these observers oppose letting the phone company tomorrow. build and own tomorrow. CATV facilities. Max, tomorrow. Goodbye. Uh, the phone system works in the United States. I think that... Uh, we just must address the question of whether uh, uh, we want cable television to be operated as a common carrier system uh, with the owners out of the business, with government regulation of, of uh, rate of return and so forth. In which case, one could make an argument that all the cable television systems ought to be owned by telephone companies and by no one else. Uh, or, on the other hand, whether you want to you want to develop cable television as a competitor to the telephone system, uh, in which case you might want to rule that telephone uh, companies shouldn't own cable television at all. H.I. Romnus, chairman of the board of AT&T, says the telephone company only got into that area to help the CATV industry. He thinks some competition between the two is fine. This, this thing I call a primary mission, the thing of setting up connections, on order uh, for minutes, only minutes at a time, perhaps from anyone to anyone else. This is the sort of a thing that has turned out to be a natural monopoly. But the, uh, the private line services we were talking about for connecting television stations, for example, and, uh, and, and CATV, if you uh, really are private line services too, are not a natural monopoly. People can build them for themselves. It is an area in which uh, 
uh, competition is entirely in order, uh, where we should be expected to compete for uh, providing those, and, uh, and we do have uh, some resources that will let us compete effectively. They certainly made a mistake 15 or 18 years ago in not getting deeper into CATV when it first started out. They would be in a much stronger position had they started earlier. But like the FCC, no one really saw the potentials of this industry until a few years ago, as I indicated earlier. The FCC itself said it didn't want to regulate CATV as recently as 1963. And now it's probably one of their principal regulatory problems. What we're doing now is steering a middle course between two groups of clientele. And we're permitting telephone companies to get into the business, kind of, at the same time we're permitting cable companies to come in in competition with them. And the ground rules aren't too clearly delineated for either. One reason the ground rules aren't too clear is that FCC staff people don't always agree among themselves. One bureau regulates the relative newcomer, CATV. It becomes sympathetic and would like to see CATV unshackled to compete with the telephone companies as well as the broadcasters. The Common Carrier Bureau regulates telephone companies and tends to side with its clientele. And, judging from recent administrative decisions on allowing phone companies to build CATV systems, the Common Carrier Bureau is winning. That's the sequence broadcast decisions almost invariably follow. A couple of industries get in on the ground floor, invest millions, and prosper. Then, along comes new technology, new techniques, CATV, for example. Entrepreneurs see wider profits, broadcasters and the phone companies see their vested interests threatened, and the battle is joined, or rather, dumped in the government's lap. And government must decide, under pressure, where special interests and the public interest combine and where they collide. Members of the Commission, my name is Douglas A. Anello. I'm the General Counsel of the National Association of Broadcasters. What the CATV people refuse to believe, apparently, is that neither this commission nor the broadcasters seek their demise. Rather, we seek their integration. At the FCC, competitors fight each other, but industry in general finds a sympathetic ear. A majority of the commission is business-oriented and very realistic about what they can or cannot do. Chairman Rosal Hyde, 40 years with the commission, expresses that point of view. A mass media, by definition, must attract the masses. The construction of a station, the operation of it, particularly in television, can cost substantial amounts of capital. A time of renewal, uh, commission must take into consideration the effect a decision would have on the investment of capital in the industry. It must. Uh, recognize that uh, we depend upon private entrepreneurs to build the stations, to provide the operating capital, to provide the service to the public. A policy which would uh, discourage the investment of capital for these purposes would hardly be in the public interest. As a matter of fact, I would challenge my critics to explain and how they would go about the business of uh, providing better programming than you can get from competitive, free effort, without being repressive, without discouraging innovation, without uh, inhibiting free expression. The meeting that we're trying to do at this time, uh, Mr. Chairman, is to give our associations feeling, and give the commission some insight into our association's feelings at this time. Uh, well, feelings like we do are important. What, I'm sorry. I, uh, feelings, of course, are important, but uh, what we need here is some uh, helpful advice on the interim procedures. Well, I, we and hope... if you want to give some uh, introductory attention to what the uh, disposition of rulemaking should be, we'd welcome that. Well, may, may I continue? Please do so. We have a distinct feeling that some members of the Commission care less what the public opinion is, and that they have already made up their mind and planned this hearing only as a whitewash of their previous arrived at decisions. Our opinion is that this body seems to be violating its public trust. It seems that it no longer acts in the public interest 
but acts only protect favored members of its communications family. It is for this reason that our association has decided to seek out members of Congress to do the following three things. One, launch an exhaustive investigation into FCC procedures and policies. Two, a special committee to study the complexities of the entire communications industry. And three, to support legislation to dissolve the FCC and create a new authority that will be better equipped to meet the growing needs of the public and provide objective and fair regulation to the entire communications industry. Thank you, gentlemen. You assert that the FCC has on occasion fallen into error in the past in many respects. Well, that's certainly a proposition with which you're going to get very little argument from me. You also say that there are some good things about cable television. But I hope at some point that you all intend to direct your attention to the issues. Because there are some problems with regard to cable television. And someone in this country must confront them. And I would hope that you would have the incentive to want to try and help. And I think in, in fairness to my colleagues in this particular instance, they're entitled to a little credit. Mr. Lovett explained the great difficulty that the industry has had in trying to resolve these problems itself. We're familiar with the difficulty Congress has had in dealing with this. And for once in its history, the FCC has made an effort to come out with a, a set of proposals that it believes to be constructive and a step forward in some effort to help a great number of people First of whom are the 200 million Americans uh, whose interests we're all supposed to be concerned about principally. Commissioner Nicholas Johnson is part of that minority which defines the public interest as much more than just industry profits. But on programming, he loses a point to the business-oriented commissioners. Well, the majority of the commission believes that programming is none of our business, that uh, broadcasting in the public interest means keeping your antenna tower painted and. Uh, seeing to it that your signal is loud and clear. The business-oriented commissioners maintain that programming can only be changed through the economics of audience appeal, not through moralizing. Local advertising to subsidize cable casting operations. Our industry has grown to its present dimensions in spite of, in many cases, and not because of, necessarily, FCC policy. Whatever the merits of the CATV inquiry, the FCC has hardly been an exemplary public servant. It's traditional to lambaste the agency. James M. Landis reported to President Kennedy the FCC was a spectacle of incompetence. Unable to change what he called the vast wasteland of TV, ex-chairman Newton Minow urged reorganization. Commissioner Robert Bartley goes further, says the whole FCC should be abolished. That would not necessarily improve matters because the agency has virtually no real authority of its own. The broadcasting lobby trains its guns of influence and persuasion on the Congress and the White House, the two places where real power lies. Thomas Hoving heads a nationwide committee of citizens concerned about improving the quality of broadcasting. Congress is not uh, particularly interested in <clears throat> having a strong regulatory agency. I mean, a man who is running for Congress, for example, <clears throat> particularly somebody who's going into a primary fight or going against an incumbent of some years standing, uh, desperately needs the uh, broadcasting facilities in that community. And uh, he is hardly likely to uh, joust seriously with the power structure of that community. When the commission has undertook to uh, introduce some additional restraints on transfers, Congress has always reacted against such efforts. There's no question in my mind that the industry gets uh, more than adequately heard uh, at this commission and uh, also in Congress. The voice of the consumer representative or the, the television viewer represent, uh, representative here in Washington tends to be rather small tends to be rather drowned in a sea of uh, noise that comes from other conflicting sources. The Congress, the trade press, the, the lobbyists, the lawyers, the employees of the agency, all really are fed by one another. We are uh, extraordinarily dependent upon the information that is brought to us by the parties who have an economic stake in the outcome of the cases. Uh, 
we have 1,500 employees, which may sound like a lot to people who are used to running little businesses, but then when you realize that of these 1,500, only a handful uh, are really professional or PhD caliber people who are thinking about long-range communications policy questions, uh, it, it really begins to, to dramatize the, the uh, tremendous contrast in resources. We undertake to represent the public. Uh, uh, I would wish that we had more funds to do uh, the research in this area. Uh, it is true that the uh, industry, uh, uh, the operating industry or the manufacturing industry is the one that's most likely to come clamoring at our doors. Uh, but it isn't true that we only respond to these kind of demands.